The challenge though is how would you identify the right use cases and what is it that you want to solve for? But then bringing predictions and automations together, I think is a very powerful combination for databases. You're listening to Data Revolution. The show about data, innovation, and economics in the rapidly changing cloud world. So Francesco, I heard you sat down with some of our team members, Somia and John, and you talked about the future of AI, databases, and data platforms. Could you tell me a little bit more? So yeah, I sat down with Sumia, who is the VP of product at Ivan, and with John, which is the head of databases. And we went through how AI is now, how companies are thinking about AI, and what are the challenges of AI. And then we switched the gear a little bit in order to understand how data platforms are evolving to assist with AI. And finally, I believe there was a good thing. I asked them what was in their wish list for the future of AI, and they gave me two really, really interesting replies. I believe Santa Claus will be a lot busy to fulfill their wish list. <laughs> well, I hope Santa definitely can go by their houses this year. And let's check it out. I can't wait to hear more. Sumia, John, it's a pleasure having you here. I feel that we have two of the mastermind behind Ivan, and I'm just here to you know, make you shine. Sumia, let's start from you. I believe if you were not under a rock in the last couple of years, AI is pretty much what everyone is talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about what are your feelings and what you see from the field about AI? Yeah, sure, Francesco. 2023 was more like a hype for AI. Uh, we saw tools like ChatGPT, DALI, just capturing the public imagination. And there were enough technical companies and startups who just hyped around the AI capabilities for funding and market share as well. However, 2024, this is where things get real. AI models are now shifting to start thinking about what are the real business problems to solve. And decision makers, however, are still wondering and perhaps not getting a clear perception of what could AI really do for their business. And I think it's going to be a super interesting year to figure out how to actually apply AI for our businesses. Well, it's, it's interesting because sometimes it feels that we are trying to look for a problem that we want to use a tool for, rather than trying to solve a problem by using a tool. And John, to you, I feel that what we saw is the potential, but probably there is also a dark side about AI. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And um, we're discovering this along with our customers, so it's kind of a, a journey for both sides. And I think you did what you said there about um, We've got a great tech, what problems can we solve is essentially where the customers are. The customers we've seen who have solved a problem underestimated the amount of data it took, where that data was stored, uh, how safe it was, um, shipping it in and then out and in and out of their systems to make sure that they have a useful response to their customers uh, and training and tuning them um, were particularly difficult. Okay, that's an interesting one and probably I want to ask a follow-up question. There is a lot of data movement that I see involved with AI. And I've been in the data space for 10 years, and one common question from companies about data is security. How is security handled in the era of AI? Well, that's a tough one, because uh, particularly in regulated industries, you do want to be compliant. So this starts to become one of the key data challenges that AI models and the AI space observes uh, in, in a nutshell. So one of the common challenges of AI is data is distributed across various systems. So getting access to relevant data for the AI models is one of the key challenges here. And doing that while ensuring compliance is one of the key as well. And this is where our CISOs, our security teams, product development teams, they're all here to see how do you keep the best practices of security and still make data accessible to AI. You touch a very interesting point that we have a lot of data assets. We have multiple technologies. We have seen companies going from using one single database or data technology to use a span of different technologies. So the question for you, John, is 
how do we make sure that AI has all the data that AI needs to perform? So how can we make sure that we feed AI with all this data coming from all these Lego pieces in our company? Yeah, it's a critical it's a critical piece of the stack for customers. And more and more, um, if you want to get a useful response out of Gen AI, it needs to be updated in near real time. So the streaming technologies such as Kafka, Kafka Connect, your ability to make sure that you're retraining, gathering customer input back into the model. There's a lot of work going on around um, how you train and tune to avoid hallucinations, and that requires near real time data to avoid any large customer impact. Yeah, and I could add here that uh, AI is quite data hungry. So probably a lot of companies face the fact that they wouldn't have sufficient volumes of data and the quality they require to actually train these models. And on the other hand, there's also something like data bias. So if you already have a bias in the data that you're feeding into AI, then your AI models also start to inherit those biases as well, which may lead into discriminating results. And this is something we need to be very careful about. It looks like to me that all the measure that we put in place about performing data quality that was done on static data now becomes even more relevant in the area of AI because we need to do that in the streaming mode because we need to be sure that whatever goes into the AI is correct. Is there something that we can do in order to address that particular pain point? A lot of trial and error, I would say and technologies uh, that offer stream processing capabilities do exactly that. They give you the possibility to shift and massage the data while on the fly so that you can start to see what kind of results you expect when it comes out of the pipeline. And the more you expose yourselves to this transformation, the more you understand your business, and the more the business leaders connect with the technology, then you start to see better results as well, because at the end of the day, Whatever comes out of the pipeline should be benefiting the business and you need to bring business and technology together here. Everything depends on the quality of the data that we have in house. And most of the time, in most companies, that data is sitting in a database. So Sumia, can you walk us through how you see the database going forward into incorporating or playing with AI? Hmm, that's an interesting one. Uh, often when we think of AI and databases, or any technology for that matter, we always think of future predictions. But there's more to it in databases space especially. There's a lot of potential in automations that is yet to be unlocked. Think um, self-indexing or, or self-tuning of databases, uh, intelligent workload balancing for better uh, resource optimization, and then proactive alerting is also one of the use cases that we can very well do with databases. And the challenge, though, is how would you identify the right use cases and what is it that you want to solve for? But then bringing predictions and automations together, I think, is a very powerful combination for databases. Can I ask a challenging question, though? If I am a DBA, do I want something that automatically tunes a database with the risk of not having predictable performance? Or do I want something that suggests me something to do and then I review and apply the suggestion whenever it's ready for me? Uh, a bit of both. So one of the things we spoke previously was how do you, the quality and the data is very important and then how much do you trust on the results that come out of the pipeline? So when you apply an AI optimization on databases, um, one of the things that it can do is provide recommendations on how to better optimize your queries. And as you learn and adopt these, this is how you're actually training the AI model as well in saying, okay, when I see a pattern like this, this is an optimization that often gets accepted by my DBA. So now you can get a bit ahead and tell your AI model, now do this automatically for me because now I start to rely more on the recommendations that come through. That's an interesting pattern. So you probably want to apply kind of the same pattern that you do as, you know, a parent. First, you give a task to the child and you watch them do. And if they do a good job, then the next time you give them a little bit more freedom and more trust, more trust until they are completely on their own doing the task by themselves. That's a very interesting analogy. And I have to say at Ivan, we have uh, recently launched AI optimizations for our database like Postgres. And one of the things we do there is uh, we offer 
free optimization possibilities on the databases across the world. And it doesn't have to necessarily sit on Ivan. But then we do offer a continuous optimization as well. So once you've seen what the capability can do, now you can take a step further and enable the continuous optimization. Okay, I believe there is a lot of things that we can do for people that are working with a database. But on the other side, I feel that traditional databases are somehow evolving to support more AI workloads. Um, John, for you, like, can you tell us how you see this coming, how you see the market changing in order to address AI use cases within the database? Yeah, for sure. Um, databases are quite slow moving things. They develop very slowly. It's often said that uh, competitive feature development is like a slow motion boxing match. Um, the great news is that the you'll get a vector database. Vector databases are key for most current Gen AI workloads. They store the embeddings that map your content and allow semantic search and all the other great capabilities. Those databases are brand new. There's some great technology out there, but they are a few years old. They will harden and get better. Um, but the older, more enterprise-ready databases, such as PG uh, and others, are gaining vector capabilities due to their community and the open source nature of them. And they will deal with nearly 80% of the AI workloads most of our customers are looking at right now. The other advantage is all our customers, if they use the capabilities in those databases, are dealing with familiar technology. They don't have to go and train a new team. They've got it all there. Uh, and it really speeds up their time to value. So yes, new technologies are coming out. Some people can adopt them. But the older, more mature products are also gaining those capabilities. And that's really going to let a lot more companies get started with Gen AI. So the, the interesting part about what you said, John, was that there is a way to evolve existing tooling, but also there is a new set of shiny tools that is appearing in the technological landscape. Sumia, where do you think there is the balance between in companies, between finding or trying the newest and shiniest database or reusing what they have in-house? Well, I think there's a there's a need for balancing both of them. Experimenting with new technologies is actually a good thing for any company because that's how you start to see what are the new developments in the market and what could be the potential applications to your business. And this is the part of experimentation and innovation that happens in every company. But on the flip side, when you have business critical workloads running in production, you don't want to mess with them. New technologies don't go to production straight off. What you do there is work with the tried and tested technologies, work out a way to expand your use case there. For example, um, vector search is coming in Postgres and, and open search. So this is how you could start to try out AI use cases while being safe and sound in production. Okay, reusing existing systems. I believe security is part of it. So having just one security system or one security on top of all your data assets is critical. But then, by reusing existing tooling, what you also get is the ability of mixing the new type of queries like vector search with the traditional type of queries. So John, can you give us an example of this? Yeah, sure. So once you've got your, your data, you can send it off, get your embeddings created, you store that alongside your, your other data, uh, and the same engineers can start running more complex queries. Essentially here, you're trying to find out better relationships between things. So for example, a simple SQL query to validate uh, how many shoes have we got in stock can go to how many shoes have we got in stock and what did the other people who purchased these shoes purchase? The uh, vector search or uh, similarity search against vectors allows it to compare uh, two similar things and provide a relationship and provide you some um, inference and context that you wouldn't get from basic SQL. Or you could get it, but that might be the worst SQL query of all time. Well, yeah, I believe that that's the key. It's both capabilities, but also simplicity. Because if you have to write a 20,000 line query in order to get a result, one, it might be slow, and second one, good luck for the other developer that needs to take care of it once you leave the company, for example. Okay, John, I believe you touched an important thing about optimizing SQL queries. And Sumi, you talk about an acquisition that we did recently of a company called EverSQL. So John, can you explain us what this means for Ivan and the future of our clients? Yeah, for sure, thanks. So yeah, really excited about the EverSQL acquisition. Um, and I think it speaks to what a lot of our customers are doing as well. We wanted to deliver 
uh, and leverage AI capabilities closest to where we we can deliver value for our customers. And so we run an awful lot of customer workloads. Uh, and in doing so, we get an insight into how they run, how they're performing that no one else has. So EverSQL was the perfect um, addition to the platform because it allows AI analysis of the workloads, specifically the queries and the indexes on those databases. Uh, and we're able to provide recommendations both on missing indexes and unused indexes, as well as query optimizations. That will increasingly get more capable and complex and automated so that people will be able to, um, essentially, uh, the AI will tell you how to optimize to save money in the cloud. So you won't need to upscale. You will be able to just make your workload run quicker. And we know that indexes and queries are the main reason why workloads are either slow or fast. And so having this built into the platform ensures that any workload hosted in Ivan running on our databases can run as best it can. That's interesting. Sumi, I have a follow-up question. Who should care about optimizing a database? I think anyone who runs a workload uh, in the cloud should care about it. But the beauty of it is you don't have to learn how to do it. We do it for you. So database optimization seems like a tool only for DBAs, but I think there is much more. Sumia, can you elaborate a little bit on this? Yeah. When, when you start to fix problems in, in a matter of days rather than weeks uh, as before, what it actually does is uh, it gives you faster time to resolution as a business, it increases customer satisfaction, and most of all, brings you the organization agility you need. Okay, Sumia and John, it's your lucky day. I'm your Santa Claus. You have one wish for the AI future. What is it? Just one. Well, okay, one, the most important one. I think for it really to take off, we need to get to a level of automation um, and simplicity that simply isn't there right now. Gen AI pi data pipelines are complex. That it requires an awful lot of knowledge within a company to use them effectively. And by use them effectively there, I mean quality control, understanding whether the model is working uh, and is it actually delivering value? You need quite a lot of knowledge and experience there. So for me, in the next year, uh, something to emerge, some set of standard processes that simplifies it for everyone to try and get these things into production would be, would be my wish. For me, um, let me latch on to the multi-cloud hype. So many companies have their workloads distributed across multiple clouds as a way to de-risk their business. Now, if I had one wish from AI, it would be that it would automatically scan my workloads, figure out which is the best cloud and the best setup to actually drive down my cloud costs and actually give me that recommendation without me needing to move a finger. Okay, that's a little bit a lot for Santa Claus. I, I cannot promise to deliver everything, but despite that, it was really interesting to talk to you about data platforms and AI and adoption and the future. So thanks a lot, Sumia and John, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Wow, that was a great conversation that you had with John and Sumia. Could you tell me the top two things that stood out to you or were your favorite? So I believe the main thing that I got was to see the dark side of AI. Everybody is super excited about AI. Everybody wants to work with AI, however, AI is not just a key that you put inside and you just turn it on. As Sumia said, we need a lot of data to make AI work. Sumia touched really well about the bias of our data assets and how we need to basically make something in order to provide to AI not only real-time data, but also data that is somehow controlled. And that can be a challenge in our fast world. But then also, I believe when we analyze the evolution of data platforms themselves, because a lot of people think about AI, about solving, you know, queries or solving, like asking AI to tell them what's the amount of sales for the month of June. But actually, there is a category of people that we can already start helping with AI, that is the people working with the databases themselves. I believe John said a lot of good things about helping the people work better with uh, data assets, with the data tools. And if we can cut the time to resolve our performance issues from a week to a minute, I believe it's better productivity, is less risk, 
it's better experience for developers and also better experience for the customers, which at the end of the day are the ones that gives you money. 100%. When you touched on John mentioning needing more data tools, data assets, I feel that's really important, especially since we are still in a phase of a lot of companies are testing. They're testing the ideas out. They're trying to figure out what they can do. And being flexible, I feel, is really important. Yeah, that, that's uh, an interesting one because the flexibility and the ability to take the data from where it is to where it's needed, it's key nowadays. Specifically when you are experimenting or with the pace of change that we see in the AI space, you don't know really if the model, the tool that you're using today will be the same tool from the same vendor in the same cloud that you will use tomorrow. So having this open mindset, this possibility of going where the next big thing is or when the, where the next useful thing is, gives, gives to companies the needed agility that they need in the AI era. Definitely. And I feel the biggest takeaway here is there's a lot of unknown. <laughs> We're still, the AI hype, it's been crazy for the last year and a half or going into like right second third year here so there's just so much unknown so it was all your points and everything that you discussed with John and Sumia sound like it's gonna be a great discussion for everyone to like think about things a little bit deeper so but I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with them and thanks for sitting down with me too thank you very much <laughs>